Hi there. This is day number 194, and I'm really glad to be able to share these readings with you. 2 Kings 15 and 16, Psalm 130, and our first reading in John 14. In yesterday's reading, on the Israel side, the ten tribes, we heard of the reign of Jehoahaz. He was helped by Elijah in his final prophecy. Then the names started getting confusing as we heard of Jehoahaz's son, Jehoash, and also in yesterday's reading we heard of Amaziah's reign in Judah, and it is confusing again because Amaziah's father was Joash, without any middle position H's. Amaziah was very unwise to insist on war with Jehoash. 2 Kings 15 Uzziah, son of Amaziah, began to rule over Judah in the twenty-seventh year of the reign of King Jeroboam II of Israel. He was sixteen years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem fifty-two years. His mother was Jecolia of Jerusalem. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his father Amaziah had done, but he did not destroy the pagan shrines, and the people still offered sacrifices and burned incense there. The Lord struck the king with leprosy, which lasted until the day he died. He lived in isolation in a separate house. The king's son, Jotham, was put in charge of the royal palace, and he governed the people of the land. The rest of the events in Uzziah's reign and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. When Uzziah died, he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David, and his son, Jotham, became the next king. Zechariah, son of Jeroboam II, began to rule over Israel in the thirty-eighth year of King Uzziah's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria six months. Zechariah did what was evil in the Lord's sight, as his ancestors had done. He refused to turn from his sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to commit. Then Shalom, son of Jabesh, conspired against Zechariah, assassinated him in public, and became the next king. The rest of the events in Zechariah's reign are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. So the Lord's message to Jehu came true. Your descendants will be kings of Israel down to the fourth generation. Shalom, son of Jabesh, began to rule over Israel in the thirty-ninth year of King Uzziah's reign in Judah. Shalom reigned in Samaria only one month. Then Manahim, son of Gadi, went to Samaria from Tirzah and assassinated him, and he became the next king. The rest of the events in Shalom's reign, including his conspiracy, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. At that time, Menahem destroyed the town of Tapua and all the surrounding countryside as far as Tirzah because its citizens refused to surrender the town. He killed the entire population and ripped open the pregnant women. Menahem, son of Gadi, began to rule over Israel in the thirty-ninth year of King Uzziah's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria ten years. But Menahem did what was evil in the Lord's sight. During his reign he refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to commit. Then King Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria invaded the land. But Menahem paid him thirty-seven tons of silver to gain his support in tightening his grip on royal power. Menahem extorted the money from the rich of Israel, demanding that each of them pay fifty pieces of silver to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned from attacking Israel and did not stay in the land. The rest of the events in Menahem's reign and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. When Menahem died, his son Pekahiah became the next king. 
Pekahiah, son of Menahem, began to rule over Israel in the fiftieth year of King Uzziah's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria two years, but Pekahiah did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to commit. Then Pekah, son of Remaliah, the commander of Pekahiah's army, conspired against him. With fifty men from Gilead, Pekah assassinated the king along with Argob and Arye in the citadel of the palace at Samaria, and Pekah reigned in his place. The rest of the events in Pekahiah's reign and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Pekah, son of Remaliah, began to rule over Israel in the fifty-second year of King Uzziah's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria twenty years, but Pekah did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to turn from the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had led Israel to commit. During Pekah's reign, King Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria attacked Israel again, and he captured the towns of Ejon, Abelbeth Maaka, Janoah, Kadesh, and Hazor. He also conquered the regions of Gilead, Galilee, and all of Naphtali, and he took the people to Assyria as captives. Then Hoshea, son of Elah, conspired against Pekah and assassinated him. He began to rule over Israel in the twentieth year of Jotham, son of Uzziah. The rest of the events in Pekah's reign and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. Jotham, son of Uzziah, began to rule over Judah in the second year of King Pekah's reign in Israel. He was twenty-five years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem sixteen years. His mother was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. Jotham did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. He did everything his father Uzziah had done, but he did not destroy the pagan shrines, and the people still offered sacrifices and burned incense there. He rebuilt the upper gate of the temple of the Lord. The rest of the events in Jotham's reign and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. In those days the Lord began to send King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah of Israel to attack Judah. When Jotham died, he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David, and his son Ahaz became the next king. Second Kings 16 Ahaz, son of Jotham, began to rule over Judah in the seventeenth year of King Pekah's reign in Israel. Ahaz was twenty years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem sixteen years. He did not do what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord his God, as his ancestor David had done. Instead, he followed the example of the kings of Israel, even sacrificing his own son in the fire. In this way he followed the detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the pagan shrines and on the hills and under every green tree. Then King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah of Israel came up to attack Jerusalem. They besieged Ahaz, but could not conquer him. At that time the king of Edom recovered the town of Elath for Edom. He drove out the people of Judah and sent Edomites to live there, as they do to this day. King Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria with this message, I am your servant and your vassal. Come up and rescue me from the attacking armies of Aram and Israel. Then Ahaz took the silver and gold from the temple of the Lord and the palace treasury and sent it as a payment to the Assyrian king. So the king of Assyria attacked the Aramean capital of Damascus and led its population away as captives, resettling them in Kir. He also killed King Rezin. King Ahaz then went to Damascus to meet with King Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria. While he was there, he took special note of the altar there. 
Then he sent a model of the altar to Uriah the priest, along with its design in full detail. Uriah followed the king's instructions and built an altar just like it, and it was ready before the king returned from Damascus. When the king returned, he inspected the altar and made offerings on it. He presented a burnt offering and a grain offering. He poured out a liquid offering, and he sprinkled the blood of peace offerings on the altar. Then King Ahaz removed the old bronze altar from its place in front of the Lord's temple, between the entrance and the new altar, and placed it on the north side of the new altar. He told Uriah the priest, Use the new altar for the morning sacrifices of burnt offering, the evening grain offering, the king's burnt offering, and the grain offering, and the burnt offerings of all the people, as well as their grain offerings and liquid offerings. Sprinkle the blood from all the burnt offerings and sacrifices on the new altar. The bronze altar will be for my personal use only. Uriah the priest did just as King Ahaz commanded him. Then the king removed the side panels and basins from the portable water carts. He also removed the great bronze basin called the sea from the backs of the bronze oxen and placed it on the stone pavement. In deference to the king of Assyria, he also removed the canopy that had been constructed inside the palace for use on the Sabbath day as well as the king's outer entrance to the temple of the Lord. The rest of the events in Ahaz's reign and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. When Ahaz died, he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. Then his son Hezekiah became the next king. This is one of the most beautiful of all the psalms, and an expression of hope for anyone in despair. Psalm 130 A Song of Ascents From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention, please, to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. In John 13, we heard of Jesus taking the role of a servant and washing the disciples' feet. Judas left the upper room, and Peter was told that he would deny knowing Jesus three times. John 14 don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am, and you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said, No, we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, 
you do know him and have seen him. Then Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am joined as one with the Father, and the Father is joined with me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am joined as one with the Father, and the Father is joined with me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that I, as the Son, can bring glory to my Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, Obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. The world cannot receive him, because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him, because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No. I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am joined as one with my Father, and you are joined as one with me, and I am joined with you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. Because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. We have just read the promise where Jesus says, You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. I think probably by now in this year you have realized that asking for something in Jesus' name does not mean tacking on in Jesus' name at the end of a prayer. It is rather praying things that will glorify Jesus. And whether or not we use the words in Jesus' name, if we are praying prayers that are for his glory, we are praying in his name. Let's pray together. Our dear Lord Christ Jesus, we thank you that you have not left us as orphans. You have sent your Spirit to be with us. And He is our Comforter, our Advocate, and our Helper. And He is with us, giving your witness in our hearts. O oh Lord, we pray that in every way we would give free reign to the Holy Spirit in our lives. Help us, Lord, not to grieve your Holy Spirit and not to quench his fire. And, Lord, if there is anything unpleasing in us, we pray that your Holy Spirit would reveal that to us now. May this also be for your glory.